right, uh, let's kick it off. So good evening, everybody. My name is Asa Margolis, and I want to welcome you to our first quarter of 2023 offering brought to you by the Mid-Atlantic Transport Conference. For those of you that have not actually joined us prior, welcome. And for those of you that have attended our prior virtual offerings, welcome back. Uh, and I think you'll see that we have changed things up a little bit for this session. So we're going to start this evening uh, with a lecture on pediatric respiratory emergencies and considerations for the transport of critically ill children. Uh, and then we're gonna transition into a panel discussion during which time we're gonna review two cases. Um, we are very fortunate this evening to have speakers and panelists that represent some of the best around the country in critical care transport and resuscitation. Uh, and I have no doubt that you will feel the same way, same way by the end of the session and we'll definitely learn a lot from the discussion and hopefully really enjoy it. So as a brief reminder, registration for our main Massey Conference uh, occurring in person at the Maritime Center in Linthicum Heights is open. It's on March 6th and 7th. Uh, so please sign up. The agenda, workshops, speakers will be awesome. And I hope uh, many of you can attend. We have a QR code on the following slide um, as well. Uh, and here are some additional sort of announcements about it. Uh, we're also happy to announce this year that we're gonna have a virtual option as well. So for those of you that can't make it in person, there will be an opportunity to attend virtually. Uh, here's a QR code. It'll be an additional opportunity to utilize this QR code uh, at the end of the uh, presentations this evening. All right, so now I really have the distinct pleasure uh, and honor of being able to introduce the panelists and uh, the lecturers for this evening. So first, uh, Dr. Noje. Dr. Noje uh, graduated from Carol de Villa University of Medicine and Pharmacy in Romania, uh, completed her pediatrics residency at St. Barnabas Hospital, which is in the Bronx, followed by a pediatric critical care fellowship at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. She is currently the medical director of the pediatric transport program uh, and associate professor in the Department of Anesthesiology and Critical Care Medicine at Johns Hopkins. She also serves as one of the central advisor pediatric physicians working for MIMS or the Maryland Institute for Emergency Medical Services Systems Pediatric Critical Care Coordinating Center as we call C4 Pediatrics. So welcome Dr. Noje. thank you so much for being here and being a panelist this evening. Uh, next, we have Dr. Phil Naraki. Uh, Dr. Naraki is an emergency medicine physician who completed his residency at Allegheny General Hospital and then an EMS fellowship at Johns Hopkins. Uh, after fellowship, he went back to Allegheny, where he currently serves as EMS medical director for Allegheny General Hospital, associate medical director for Allegheny Health Network, Life Flight and Critical Care, and core faculty for the EMS fellowship program there. Um, Phil, great to see you back. Phil was one of my fellows. Uh, and incredibly, incredibly proud of what you have accomplished so far in, in your in your career. So great to have you back, Phil. Thanks, Brad. Absolutely. Uh, next, we have Brad Cooch. Brad is currently Director of Medical Operations for the Center for Emergency Medicine and Stat Medevac, uh, and previously the Director of Critical Care Transport Team at UPMC Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh. Uh, he has extensive experience. He has 13 years of neonatal and pediatric critical care experience, 10 of which were spent as a respiratory therapist on the team. Uh, additionally, Brad spent three years as an ECMO coordinator and researcher with the Heart Institute. Uh, he has presented his research and continuing education lectures both nationally and internationally. Brad has also published several chapters and papers in the area of pediatric critical care and transport medicine. We are very fortunate to have Brad with us this evening, and he will also be de delivering a uh, sort of fundamental knowledge lecture at the beginning of our session this evening. So Brad, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. And then um, our final panelist is Monty Brown. Uh, Monty also comes with uh, an incredible amount of experience. Uh, she has had 21 years of experience working as a critical care transport paramedic with the bulk of the first part of her career spent with the general transport team and then more recently with the pediatric specialty team. Over the course of her career, she has always had a passion for education. Uh, I can certainly attest to that, serving both formally and informally as educational roles throughout her entire career. Welcome, Ani, thank you. 
Uh, and now the moderators for this evening. So the main moderator is obviously going to be Sam Matei. Uh, to a much smaller extent, I will be doing some moderating. So Sam, obviously we need to introduce you as well. You didn't send me a bio, so I had to make up one for you. Uh, so Sam has spent uh, the past 16 years as an emergency and critical care nurse with the first four as a trauma critical care nurse with the U.S. Army. Uh, the past 12 years has been spent as a critical care transport and flight nurse working in direct support of major academic medical centers in the national capital region. Sam has always had a passion for education. I can also attest to that um, and was a founding member of a nonprofit uh, with the mission of offering low or no cost education to the air medical community. Uh, beginning early on in Sam's career, he has served both a formal and informal role uh, within education for multiple programs that he has worked with. So, Sam, again, I am always very fortunate to be able to work with you. Uh, and then, again, my name is Ace Margolis. I started my career also in pre-hospital medicine about two decades ago. Uh, I'm a board-certified EMS physician after completing my fellowship training at Johns Hopkins, where I also completed residency. I'm currently an assistant professor of emergency medicine at Johns Hopkins and the director of the EMS Fellowship Program. I'm also the medical director of the Johns Hopkins Lifeline Critical Care Transport Program and associate medical director of the Howard County Department of Fire and Rescue Services. Uh, I also work pretty closely with several local, state, and federal law enforcement agencies as a medical officer within the Center of Law Enforcement Medicine at Johns Hopkins and the deputy medical director of the United States Secret Service. So before I kick it over to Sam to discuss the agenda and plan for this evening, uh, a few disclaimers. So remember, the opinions conveyed here do not necessarily represent those of any specific institution, agency, or body of government. Uh, the material here is, is a summary. Again, not meant to be completely comprehensive. Uh, you should always go back and continue to read on your own. Uh, and then always the information that we present here does not and should not supersede the recommendations and decisions of your own EMS agency's leadership and medical direction. So Sam, I'm gonna kick it over to you to discuss the uh, the plan for the evening, uh, and then we'll get started with our lecture. All right, pretty simple uh, pretty simple plan. Uh, we're gonna get uh, some great education um, from Brad. He's gonna lay us a, a nice foundation on uh, pediatric respiratory distress. Um, and then uh, we'll kick into a couple cases uh, where the panel and this um, amazing group of people that Asa has just uh, introduced, uh, we'll, we'll talk through a couple cases and how best to approach them, some pearls for management, those type of things. Um, so without further ado here, I am going to kick it over to Brad. Uh, I'm gonna stop sharing and Brad, you can pop your slides up and uh, we'll, get some, uh, we'll get some knowledge laid on us. Thank you, Sam and Asa. I'm just gonna pull these up. Sam, I'm switching. Did that come across okay? Excellent. And I'm coming. You can hear me all right, Sam? All right. First, I want to thank the group for uh, having me, me here. Um, I'm really happy to um, take some time to present a topic that's been a big part of my career um, since I, I began uh, the healthcare um, career that, that I've had since uh, 1999, and that's pediatric respiratory distress, bronchiolitis, and asthma. Um, as previously mentioned, I flew for about 13 years as a frontline flight therapist with Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh, then did about three years as the ECMO coordinator, and then I was lucky enough to take over the transport team and respiratory care as the director um, working uh, in this environment. Um, my whole career has been nothing less than amazing, so I'm happy to be present to, today, and I'm glad everybody could be here. So a couple pieces, um, I wanna start with the objectives and I wanna discuss the airway differences and in infants and children's because it does um, relate to these two diseases um, in a way that, that presents some different challenges. Um, I also wanna review the assessment of children um, that includes infants and children. Um, most notably, um, you know, identifying uh, shock in these kids, respiratory failure, and just a systematic approach that I've, I've used and it's been documented in a couple different um, texts and literature, um, how to uh, assess these children and be ahead of the curve before they become uh, more ill. I wanna discuss bronchiolitis in a little more detail and pediatric asthma. And then I wanna review some um, frequently used respiratory support modalities. There's a lot of emerging evidence coming out of there and out in these different 
um, pieces. So I do want to go over those a little bit. Um, to second what Asa said is that, you know, these are not really protocols that come out of any specific spot. These are really an overview of tactics and approaches to um, supporting these kids. They are evidence-based. Um, so I urge everybody to take this as foundational concepts and then always refer to your medical direction, your protocols. I do urge people to read the literature. Um, there's some really nice um, papers coming out, especially in the area of bronchiolitis um, that, that are helpful in terms of resuscitation. So um, I'm going to begin a lecture with talking about the uh, airway differences in infants and children because in children because it, it it does matter and many of these things that we see do emerge out of these differences. So um, thinking of the head and upper body, first of all, their um, head is large, so they have a large head to body ratio. Um, this is often why in the trauma setting you see a lot of kids or kids with um, a higher proportional number of head injuries because. Their, their head is larger and it does take their body in a certain, certain direction. They don't have the muscles to control their head. Um, so they do result in the head being flung around. They also have a large occiput, which really does relate to the positioning of the upper airway. Um, they also have larger tongues um, in comparison to the oral opening. Um, I will also mention that in some of these kids that you disease uh, see with the different syndromes, um, this large, large tongue can provide provide a, a different challenge. Um, Down syndrome, uh, glycogen storage diseases, large tongues can um, cause obstruction in their own right, not only from visually seeing the airway, but also falling back and occluding the airway. The larynx is more um, is higher in the neck. Um, it's somewhere between three and four versus five in the adult. The larynx is also funnel shaped. That's why often you'll hear um, different selections of ET tube. And then one of my, um, what I would say, um, talking points in general is um, the epiglottis is shorter and um, less flexible and U-shaped. So often uh, when we intubate and we use a curved blade, we go into blicula to um, lift the airway. That's why in the neonatal group, they use a straight blade because they um, directly lift that um, epiglottis um, to help control it. Um, in terms of long, uh, large tongue, they also have more tonsinal and adenoid tissue, which can be exacerbated with upper airway obstruction. When I talk about some of these viruses that affect um, kids and result in bronchiolitis, I want to also keep in mind that these do affect the upper airway. We see kids now that are surviving longer at a younger age. So um, 24 weekers are not uncommon. Um, the resuscitation um, pieces are even getting younger in gestation. So with these kids, often they get intubated and can have some um, uh, upper airway trauma. Um, that can be more affected with a narrow airway with um, swelling secondary to viruses. And a lot of these viruses do affect the same piece. Um, the infant's head is larger, though his nasal path, their nasal passages are smaller, which can be um, additionally easily obstructed because of um, mucus or uh, inflammation. And then nasal intubation is more difficult and riskier in this patient population because of the adenoid tissue and small nasal passages. We often don't see that. However, some centers may electively choose to intubate um, through the nose, which is a, a challenge in its own right. Larynx is funnel shaped. Um, the cricoid cartilage is the most narrow portion of the pediatric airway, thus eliminating need for cup tubes. That evidence is going back and forth, honestly. I think um, cup tubes in their own right can be used um, with relative safety. I also um, often use cup tubes in situations where you're going to have a high ventilatory pressure and you need to um, create a seal. Uh, small radius means greater impact edema on the cross-section air, uh, area of the airway. Um, what this means is a little bit of inflammation secondary to the viral infection will greater increase the resistance than compared to a larger child or adult. Also, the mucosa of the infant's um, larynx is thin and easily traumatized. So often, if somebody's taken um, a couple tries to get a patient intubated, it's not uncommon for you to visualize the airway and find some um, blood tinge secretion, and this may result in swelling as well. Conducting airways, large airways of the infant are shorter and narrow than the adults, thus higher resistance. Um, I do have some information there about the normal um, newborn trachea is about five to six centimeters long and four uh, millimeters in diameter. And the reason I like to put that in there is um, people often forget if you do have a successful intubation and you have it secured at a certain um, depth, one half centimeter movement can result in a right main stem. 
have it set on the crina or unfortunately be extubated. So please keep in mind that in a smaller child, anywhere, you know, one month and under, the trachea is only five to six centimeters long. Right main stem um, bronchus actually come off um, on the right side at a less acute angle than an adult, making right main stems very common. So when you do assess those breast sounds, which are really important, make sure you're making a determination, are these breast sounds equal bilaterally? And then um, the brachial tronchial tree of the infant is more compliant than that of an adult. Um, this is really important to keep in mind. Um, when you have an infant uh, under the age of six months and they have respiratory distress, it is not uncommon for them to collapse the upper airway with respiratory distress. So some of their respiratory distress could be because of upper airway collapse, which um, can result in worsening respiratory compromise, airway trap, uh, gas trapping, excuse me, or over dis uh, distension. The distal airways, which I always find quite fascinating as a respiratory therapy, um, therapist, um, the part that I always think is really interesting is the growth of the distal airways lags behind that of the proximal airway in the first five years of life. Um, much of the resistance of the adult comes from the upper airway and the first generation, where in the infant and, and child, the resistance is four times greater than the adult in the lower airways. So what that means is a little bit of inflammation, a little bit of bronchoconstriction will cause a fourfold greater increase in resistance. Upper airways are often less helpful in infants and children in respiratory distress. So good positioning is always important, but also keep in mind that secondary airway issues may be lower in the airway. Respiratory units, um, a child is born with 20 million at birth, and by the age of eight, they will have 300 million alveoli. Um, anybody that's taking care of children that, children that may have um, uh, uh, congenital diaphragmatic hernia, this is one of the, the reasons that they can grow new lung is because they're constantly growing lung. The diameter of the alveolus is double that um, in adults than that of the child. And what happens with this is um, it's more prone to collapse. So positive end expiratory pressure is more helpful. And then finally, um, there's less diffusion capacity. It's about a third of an adult. So it's harder to keep it open. They're more prone to atelectasis and their diffusion capacity is less than an adult. So as we consider those anatomic differences in a child compared to an adult, you can see how some of these things that we're going to experience, especially with viruses and bronchoconstriction, um, can lead to um, compounding factors of increased respiratory work, increased um, CO2 production, and also um, hypoxia. The approach that I like to use in children and has been um, demonstrated in several um, manuals as recommendations is really assessing these children in a way that is systematic, um, starting in a logical format. Um, this is not a comprehensive assessment. You should continue to use the assessment that's advocated by your particular group, um, but it does focus on what I call the A, B, Cs, and I keep S in there for a very specific reason, which is shoulder, which we'll talk about. Um, I like to use this assessment for every patient. If it's a, a seizure patient that I approach, a bronchiolytic, an asthmatic, a pneumonia, or an injured patient, I like to approach them from the same um, approach, which is the ABCs. It should help you ident identify um, those in distress or um, extremists, if you will. And these are helpful hints, and they don't replace the concise as, um, assessment. So once you go through these, you may have to go down through different pathways to understand what's going on. Case in point, you hear Strider, you rule it out that it's not um, croup. Is it a foreign body? So there is additional assessments that go into this, but I really wanted to keep it clean looking at the ABCs. So starting with the airway, the first thing is, um, and I always like the approach um, and coming from the doorway and looking in and kind of doing the pyramid of what the patient looks like. We should always remember that when we come in, regardless of the color of flight suits that we're wearing, I used to wear blue, now I wear black. When we come in there, the child knows that you are A, a stranger, and that you don't, aren't normally there, and then you're imposing with your, your flight suit. So they're going to immediately become more um, higher heart rate, a little bit of higher respiratory rate, and going to become concerned. So from the doorway, you should assess what they look like. Are they breathing comfortably? Are they in a good position? They're not tripoding? Are they lethargic? That should be your first primary assessment for the door before ever interacting with these patients. But when you do, the first thing you should look at is the airway. Is it pain? 
Think of ventilation CO2, which we all know. So you're looking for palpable airflow, upper airway obstruction, asynchronous chest and abdominal mo movement. In the child, if you have asynchronous chest and abdominal movement, so chest goes down, the belly goes up, that's a primary indicator that there's air, upper airway obstruction. So that may be a situation that you have to focus your first assessment at the airway. Another piece is, are they maintaining an airway? How are the breath sounds, snoring res respiration? Are they managing their secretions? Um, or are they having obstructive apneas? Um, and then finally, protective airway reflexes. Do they have a cough and gag? Um, one of these um, pieces that I always keep in mind is whenever I um, take care of a post patient, um, and I have to decide if I'm going to intubate or not, I want to consider their upper airway reflexes. One of the things that I used to do is we took a, um, usually it was a 14 French suction catheter and just slide it down the back of the throat. If they cough, good, they're protecting their airway. Also, another positive sign is if they try to bite the catheter or bite you, that's a positive sign. They're protecting their airway. And those are the first three steps in airway. The next is B, breathing. And the one point that I think we all should keep in mind is in a pediatric, not all causes of cyanosis can be pulmonary because they can also be non-pulmonary in nature. So when I look at a patient, again, you can do it from the doorway or more hands-on approach. I look at respiratory rate, fast or slow. I try to do it prior to interacting with them because when they see me, they're gonna to try to get to mom. They're gonna react. You wanna see what their pattern looks like. I often count my respiratory rate before I ever interact them. So you'll see me come up, look at my watch and count their pattern. It's really good to actually get a good respiratory rate. I would urge you not to count on the monitor because they're not always accurate just because of the way um, things are. Um, I would get a good respiratory rate at about 15, 30 seconds, take it times two or times four. And then when you look at them, I would get their pattern, depth, inspiratory and expiratory time, and is there an increased work of breathing? So when I talk about inspiratory and expiratory time, it's a good indicator of, are they having a resistance issue? Do they have asthma? Are they taking a quick breath in and a long breath out? That's a good way to identify if they're airway obstruction. Breath sounds. I urge everybody, don't just do the top apices. We're all guilty of it, but do the apices down, do the sides, do up under the axilla and get a good um, listen. In these kids that have a low body mass, they may be thinner, you can hear breath sounds that may be transmitting from the lower airway to the upper airway or vice versa. So you wanna listen to each one of those regions. And then finally, assess the skin, skin color. Are they cyanotic? Is it peripheral or central? Um, those are very important parts. Um, acrocyanosis in a newborn population is, is um, a, a very common thing. However, in a four-year-old, you want to understand where that cyanosis is. I do have a little bit of an image here, and I like this, and I actually created a, a lot of years ago now, I'm, I'm embarrassed to say, but it's just looking at a pattern of, of breathing. So the red is a normal breathing pattern, and then these quick up and down is coo small breathing. Coo small breathing is very indicative of um, DKA, and you can pick that up in the pattern. It can lead you in a different pathway. Are they in respiratory distress because they're having airway obstruction or they breathe in fast and coo small because they're DKA? These are just some areas they really can help you go down that path of a, a diagnosis differential. Um, circulation, um, I think it's probably one of the areas that I investigated through most of my career, which was um, shock and, resusc and resuscitation of shock. And it begins with circulation. So um, heart rate, rhythm, rate, and strength all very important, but again, is it sustain, sustained or did their heart rate go to 180 because we put an IV in? So you have to identify, is it related to fever, a procedure we're doing, or is it sustained? It's a good indicator of A, are they in shock because kids will increase their heart rate to um, compensate for shock. And that's one um, area that can lead you down that path. Also central and peripheral pulses. Um, pulse dip, uh, pressure differentials between central and peripheral are great indicators. Kids have this amazing um, way of clamping down their peripheral vasculage and pushing blood back to their important um, organs. When they do that, um, it gives us a difference. So always check um, their FEMS or their brachials um, and also their pedals, their radials. Understand if there's a difference because that'll give you an idea if they need a little bit of more volume or not. Um, kids with respiratory distress 
lose about one and a half times water, uh, more water than adults through their insensible losses, i.e. their respiratory tract, than adults do. So they become dehydrated quicker. They also often don't feed well when they're in respiratory distress. So that sets them up for hypovolemic um, shock, something to keep in, in um, mind. So a good fluid challenge is never a bad thing. Um, one of the more important pieces, which I'll show you actually in a couple of slides, is capillary refill. Um, you know, PALS usually says less than two seconds. Um, Sam's two seconds, maybe my three seconds. I always used to use three seconds. Is it greater than three seconds or is it less? Um, but delayed cap refill is a very significant sign of shock. However, I would like to point out that there's a difference between prolonged cap refill in a patient that's sitting in a diaper underneath the um, air conditioning vent, who's playing, babbling, and seems normal, versus a child who is prolonged cap refill, who's logic and not responding to mom. So there's a difference there, and keep that in mind. That brings us to the next step, which is altered level of consciousness. Often, an early sign of shock, and the question I would ask is, are they age appropriate? And then finally, urine output's a good one if you're trying to identify if their um, fluid status is good. I know we put in here um, less than uh, one cc per kilo per hour is considered decreased renal perfusion. One of the little pieces I used to use is simply ask mom, hey, is he or she making the same amount of wet diapers? Are they going to the bathroom the same amount of time? And that'll be an indicator of their fluid status. And that brings to our last part, which is sugar. So in a neonatal population, hypoglycemia is defined as less than 50. Um, and a pediatric is less than 60. I have down some symptoms there, neonatal seizures, altered mental consciousness, jitterness, apnea, regular respirs, and the pediatric coma, anxiety, headache, weakness, abdominal pain, and seizures. Um, I did put in red with a little um, note here that early identification of hyper or hypoglycemia can easily be accomplished with a bedside glucose testing system. It's always good practice when picking up a child to ask the caregiver, so the nurse in the ED, did you get a blood sugar? How long ago was it? And what was it? If they say, you know what, we just didn't get one, it's not a bad idea to pull a quick one just to confirm that you're in a good spot. And the reason I say that is a, a, an older study, this is from 2000, um, but there's an emergency, a pediatric emergency room physician, uh, Dr. Losick, that demonstrated that there was an 18% of children requiring resuscitative interventions were found to be hypoglycemic with an associated increase in mortality. Um, his definition of hypoglycemia was less than 40, and what he found is those that had hypoglycemia had a mortality rate of 55%. That alone leads us to the, the conclusion that it's okay to check a quick blood sugar. You can pull it out of an IV line, or if you have to stick the, the patient's um, finger as well. So one of the areas of work that we did, and this was under um, the mentorship of um, Dr. Orr, and um, Joe Carcillo, um, we had a multi-center database, 4,905 kids, where we looked at signs of shock. Now, this is an unadjusted mortality rate looking at physi physiologic parameters. So what we did is we looked at time index one, and this study was defined at, at the time of call um, and prior to the team getting to them. Um, it was five centers, and we looked at kids that had no signs of shock, hypotension only, Pro -capillary, uh, prolonged capillary refill defined as longer than three seconds only, or if they had hypotension and prolonged cap refill. And when you looked at this unadjusted data, what we found is those kids that had prolonged cap refill only or hypotension and prolonged cap refill were statistically more likely to die. In fact, in the um, latter group, which was hypotension and prolonged cap refill, one out of every four of those kids in this data set, uh, data set did not survive to discharge. This paper is published. It's in um, pediatrics if you're looking for it. We did add some shock index information into it as well and looked at timely resuscitation of these kids. Interestingly, these data remain consistent across all diagnostic categories. That included you know, respiratory distress, cardiac, trauma, um, et cetera. So it is a nice paper if you're interested in it. Okay, so let's get into bronchiolitis. So bronchiolitis by the definition is acute infection of the lower uh, respiratory tract. It's a process of inflammation and edema of the smaller airways or the bronchioles. Often it begins with an upper respiratory tract infection and spreads to lower airway within a couple of days. Um, we often hear people, especially in the media recently saying RSV, RSV, RSV. 
I just want to point out bronchiolitis is a group of viral illness that includes um, those illness that has um, respiratory syncytial virus, also paroinflu, influenza, rhinovirus, among others. And these viruses affect both the upper and lower airway. So it's actually a group of viruses that cause this um, clinical presentation. Typically, bronchiolitis is, is infants is self-limiting disease. Um, cleaner put, it's basically um, supportive in nature. The natural history of the illness is not dramatically altered by therapies. We've done a lot of work around this. And what we know is it really doesn't change the duration or the level of illness. It's supportive in nature. Median duration of the illness for children under the age of 24 months is about 12 days. After 21 days, approximately 18% will remain ill. And after 28 days, 9% will remain ill. Often there's risk factors associated with this, premature birth, um, heart disease, meaning congenital or acquired in these children. So the diagnosis is made truly by signs and symptoms. It's a clinical diagnosis. What are we looking at? So these kids may present with URI, upper respiratory infection, rhinorrhea with respiratory illness. They have wheezing, retractions. They may or may not have low saturations. They have tachypnea. Some have color change, and they're often nasal flaring. Um, I will tell you, you know, we, we call it wheezing. Some call it ronchi. But that wheezing can be a, a combination of A, increased resistance, so um, constricted airways, often because of inflammation, or cellular debris in the airway. So it kind of sounds what I, people call a wash machine. A little bit of ronchi, a little bit of wheezing. It's kind of everything, and it's everywhere throughout the chest. I also want to point out, as I mentioned earlier, they're often dehydrated. Um, they're dehydrated because A, they're not feeding, B, they may have a fever, and C, they're losing more um, insensible loss through their uh, respiratory tract. These kids are often admitted for hypoxemia and dehydration. I do often tell people to be particularly concerned in toxic appearing, profound lethargic um, patients, or those that have a high fever greater than 39. I did put up here a little bit of a chest X-ray with um, from bronchiolitis. Admittedly, it's not great. Um, you do see some, in, some inflammation, not always infl uh, having infiltrates. There is some streakiness to it. Um, sometimes atelectasis, it, we call it rovering atelectasis. It may be there one day, maybe not the next. And it's often because of cellular debris. This disease causes a lot of shelling of um, uh, cellular tissue. So they have increased mucus production and um, particulate in the airway that they have to move, thus the increase in mucus, mucus production. What I like to teach with these um, these films is if you look at the um, belly bubble, if you see how that looks um, kind of darker, that bubble should match the lung fields. If those lung fields are more white, it means there's a consolidation. If they're considerably more darker than that gastric bubble, then that would be considered hyperinflated. In these kids, we usually, our first step is oxygen um, supplementation. And then often we try, um, I think more for us than anyone, but is a beta agonist. So oxygen therapy is required when the saturation is consistently below 90%. These kids don't feel well. They're often feisty and trying to get a nasal cannula on them can be um, a task in its own right. Um, there's a lot of different tactics you can use, but a little bit of oxygen because these kids are still somewhat um, nose breathers can help immensely, um, but oxygen administration is good. In our environment, low by oxygen, really not that effective. You have too much wind current because of um, the rotor, people moving inside a small space. So blow by oxygen may initially add some supplemented support. However, I always like going to a nasal cannula and you can use a little tegaderm to um, put the nasal prongs in the nose and then hold it down. Um, bronchodilator therapy and racemic epi, um, should not be prescribed. So the evidence suggests that um, bronchodilators probably do not provide much support. So there's two large randomized um, trials comparing nebulized epinephrine to a placebo or albuterol. Um, in the hospital setting, they found no improvement in length of stay or un other inpatient outcomes. I will preface it with, um, I do personally, and this is just my opinion, like racemic epi, usually at a dose of 11.25 milligrams, because there's an alpha effect with racemic epi and a beta effect. <coughs> Excuse me. 
if you give that drug, you will get a little bit of bronchodilatation from the airways that may be constricted um, by smooth muscle, but you're also getting a slight alpha effect that will dilate the airway out. Um, the evidence suggests it's not very helpful. This is just one of my practices that we've done and something to consider. However, that is something you need to take through your medical direction and read some of the evidence behind it. Okay, asthma. Um, asthma is a, another uh, disease that inflammation is a primary cause of. There's a lot of effects or a lot of causes for asthma. There is environmental pieces, animal dander, cold weather, um, poor air quality, but there's also viral etiologies that cause this um, chronic airway inflammation. Um, the bronchioles are hyper-responsive, so they react because of a number of different pathways, and it often results in airway obstruction. There's inflammation, there's acute bronchoconstriction, there's airway edema, and mucus plugging. Um, these are really um, common in the asthma group. And one of the things I'll tell you that has been always a piece with my practice is if you pick up a patient, let's say older than the age of eight, and you listen to him, you hear wheezing, but you hear some rock eye, a nice practice is to say to them, hey, cough for me. When they cough, they'll actually clear that rock eye sound, and you can get a better assessment of what their wheezing is. Is it early inspiratory, late expiratory? And it'll help you identify a little more what those breath sounds are. I put up um, uh, just a chest x-ray, and this isn't so much asthma. It's more looking at a touch of asthma, but a huge raging pneumonia. And the reason I put up here is a couple pieces. So first, I want to have a, a second to show you guys. There's a gastric bubble down here in a larger patient. You can see the airway fields look a little more, um, a little darker, if you will. But this consolidation on the right side of the chest is definitely pronounced. It's darker, or I should say lighter, than the air bubble. So that's definitely indicative of some sort of a consolidation. Also, if you look at this part, the reason I have that red arrow there is these kids can be also um, dehydrated. I always look at the heart and see the width of it. Is it larger than half of the chest film or not? In this situation, they're, they're a little dry. And there's a couple concerns with a pneumonia like this and given lots of fluid, but just wanted to point that out for the group. One of the um, best practices, and admittedly, asthma scoring is subjective. So I'm going to use Sam again because Sam and I have spoken a lot, and this is I think he'll be okay with it. But one of the thing is um, the subjective scoring of asthma scores um, definitely going to be different. So Sam may look at a patient and score them at five. I may score them a seven. So there is some subjectivity in it, but it's a good practice to at least understand where these patients are. This is one asthma distress score. It's published, it's out there, and it looks at age, um, respiratory rate, <coughs> um, oxygenation, air entry, work of breathing, and wheezing. These develop a score that's a composite score that can range anywhere between five and 15, depending where they're at. So using these parameters, you can kind of get an idea of how sick they truly are. The reason this is um, useful, depending where you're at, you know, inside an ED is different than in an aircraft. Some literature has suggested, and some of the programs out there use a very structured asthma severity based therapy guidance. This is one that I threw together from multiple different sources. But in this situation, they would say if they had an asthma distress score between one and five, they would give um, weight-based albuterol puffs, four, six, eight. Again, it's your protocol um, and your, your guidance. However, if they were more of a moderate, an asthma distress score of six to 10, they would go into a continuous drug aerosol. So under 30 kilos, they may do 10 milligrams per hour. And if they were greater, they would do 15. Couple pieces with that. When it comes to continuous drug aerosols, all the evidence suggests this is not a long-term remedy. If they are and require long-term continuous drug aerosol, there's some evidence that suggests, um, and it's, these studies have been validated, that overuse of albuterol or albuterol toxicity does cause some level of diastolic dysfunctioning with an associated increase in um, cardiac injury markers. So I would just be aware, if you're doing uh, continuous drug aerosol, I would often reassess. It should be for one hour, reassess, question the second hour, and looking for a way to decrease those pieces. Um, there is some evidence that I believe Ann Thompson was one, the lead author on, but 
there is some evidence that said if you're looking at the second hour of continuous drug aerosols, if you give ipotropium or atrovent, it does decrease the rate of ICU admission and hospital uh, admission. Then finally, um, some scores that are what I'd consider severe, <clears throat> 11 to 15, um, would consider heliox. And again, that's your protocol. Supplemental oxygen, just a real quick refresher. Um, want to remain consistent with time here. Um, nasal cannula, one to six liters per minute. Some groups do add humidity for comfort. Simple face mask, you can see their FiO2 is delivered. Benny mask is good if you have retainers such as um, ACF child. Um, and then you have partial and non-rebreathers. Just want everybody to be aware of respiratory insufficiency in a child. Um, one thing I will tell you is if you are using high concentration FiO2, non-rebreather, um, high flow nasal cannula, and your SATs are still around 90, and your PO2 is between 50 or 60, you may need to think of another pathway. That could be non-invasive positive pressure or something else. A CO2 greater than 50 with a pH less than 7.3 is also considered insufficiency. Um, frequent dips in SpO2, if you have a good definitive oxygen delivery system and you consider the drop, they may be failing supplemental oxygen. You may need to take a next, next step. Um, increased respiratory stress on responsible O2 therapies, one, lethargy with, um, as measured by GCS, and then um, increasing modeling. One of the areas that I think we're all excited, and, and I, um, Sam and I have a colleague that did a lot of work around this, but is high flow nasal cannula. The first thing is um, it, you have to understand what the device does. It does wash out CO2 in the pharyngeal dead space and the bronchial tree. Um, it gets rid of the CO2 while adding fresh high concentration FiO2 gas. It does um, consider or it does require, excuse me, um, conditioning of the gas, um, 37 degrees Celsius at the nose. That's why we need to have a device that does that and make sure that um, we can provide good humidity at the right, um, right gas flow. It does not create clinical significant PEEP. So there is some studies out there that suggest that it does increase some PEEP. I would just um, caution that it's usually about two to three CMs, very low level. And if the patient opens their mouth or breathes quicker, you will lose that um, end expiratory pressure. So just keep that in mind. It's not a definitive positive pressure creating device. This is one example, I have no ties to this, but one example that we've used, and the reason I like this um, is because of a couple points. First of all, um, the nasal canos on the right side work very well, large lumen, they work great. Um, it's very compliant for the children because they have these pads already put on that you can stick. And then on the left side here, um, the reason I have this picture in is if you see these blue caps, these are actual pre pressure pop-offs. So if you have it in the nose and it exceeds a certain pressure, it'll actually pop off and cause no injury. So here's a couple indications. Um, respiratory distress, um, oxygen required uh, requirement, meaning um, to get a sac greater than 92, uh, FiO2 90%, um, it's a good device. Post -expedition, uh, extubation support, and then viral etiology. Most evidence comes um, for high flow nasal cannula comes from bronchiolitis um, in its general, and I have some flow rates on the bottom here. This is one example of something to look at. So if you're transporting these kids, you're thinking of um, a pathway. This is one that we put together, looking at starting it within one to two hours, monitoring, looking at respiratory rates, saturations, and when you would pull triggers to consider positive pressure or not. Um, positive pressure, just to um, keep everybody informed, there's four different types of non-invasive support. There's high flow, which we just discussed. There's CPAP that um, helps open up the alveolus and get rid of dead space. That can be a face, a full face mask or a nose and mask. There's nasal CPAP, which goes through prongs. And then there's BiPAP support, which also gives you ventilation and oxygenation. And I know, Sam, I'm, I'm working on it <laughs> for the sake of time. But there's a couple different devices. I mentioned the, the full face mask. These are what we call firesman's mask. They go around the whole face and they are basically provide positive pressure to the nose and mouth, benefit, great seal, total face, um, offloads pressure on the bridge of the nose. However, sizes can be a limitation and you can get breakdown in the chin, nasal mask, easy to fit, minimal dead space, um, decreases risk of aspiration, uh, of aspiration 
and the limitations include, uh, include massive leak and loss of volume and pressure at times. Here's a couple of uh, what I would say references that I used going through here. And then finally, for the sake of time, I wanna thank you and I'm happy to take any questions or I'll hand it back over to Sam. Thanks, Brad. All right, awesome, Brad, thank you so much. Greatly appreciate it, that was a great lecture and uh, so happy to have you have joined us this, this evening. Uh, Sam, as you get things transitioned over, um, Let's hold the questions for now. Please continue to put them in the chat. There's gonna be certainly some overlap between the questions for this last lecture and some of the questions that may come up during our panel discussion. Uh, but let's hold the questions for now, put them in the chat. We'll get to them in a little bit. Uh, Sam, why don't you kick it off with the uh, first case for our panel? So this is our first case. Um, so four month old, you get dispatched for a, a four month old male with worsening respiratory distress and uh, subcostal retractions. Uh, diagnosed with RSV two days ago or 24 hours earlier, sent home. Kid goes home, gets worse, uh, comes back to the ED. I'm sure we've all heard this story. We've all been asked to transport this kid. Uh, comes back febrile to Kipnik, sats in the 80s uh, on room air. Um, was placed on heated high flow at the outlying facility um, with escalating uh, requirements for that heated high flow. Uh, they keep turning it up. The kid's not getting a whole lot better. Uh, so the decision was made to transfer to a facility with, a, with PICU capabilities uh, due to that increasing support. They're like, we're getting to the top of, end of where we feel comfortable. They don't have a PICU. Your current vitals are a heart rate of 141. BP looks good at 104 over 59. Now setting 97%. Um, and uh, breathing 54 times a minute. Uh, the heated high flows at 16 liters and 50% uh, uh, on uh, about an eight kilo kid, um, just to give you guys some context. Um, and uh, you as the transport team walk in and they say, thank God you're here. We were about to put this kid on non-invasive because he's getting to the top end of our, our high flow limits. They... They said two per kilo is about where they cap out on the high flow. So a couple goals of treatment, and uh, I wanted to sort of talk to the panel and ask a couple questions. Um, the, the first one being titration of heated high flow on this kid, um, and then triggers for that non-invasive. Like I said, the nurse says to you, oh, we were about to put him on high, or we were about to put him on non-invasive because we've maxed out on the high flow. So I'd be interested to hear... Um, we'll start with you, Karina. I'd be interested to hear how you would want um, or how you how you direct your teams to to titrate high flow. Um, can we end up with too much high flow? Yeah, I mean, obviously, first of all, thank you, Asa, for your very kind introduction. I didn't even get a chance to thank you and congrats, Brad. This was a phenomenal um, um, presentation. I'm sure the audience um, is learning uh, quite a bit. Um, this is a case that we have, uh, you know, we have been seeing quite a bit uh, recently. I probably have seen a hundred plus of them in a, a between the um, my PICU job and the medical director job for transport and the MIMS job, <laughs> um, just in a in a in a you know month or two. Um, and I think that um, I think that probably uh, the way I would have answered this question would have been a little bit different a few months prior than it is now. Um, so it's quite, uh, it's quite an interesting uh, story. Um, I mean, obviously what I would wanna know, regardless of um, sort of the flavor of the titration is how is the child looking um, right now? Um, because if I'm going back to look at just the set of vitals, I can't remember if he was febrile or not, but the heart rate seemed okay. Um, for about a four-month um, baby, um, so four month, um, you know, about 140, um, that I thought looked, um, you know, decent. Um, so that, um, you know, didn't make me think that he was, um, you know, retaining CO2 and being um, tachycardic from hypercarbia, or you know, showing me um, some subtle signs of shock. Um, the blood pressure is a touch on the high side for me, and it could be um, because it so happens that a lot of these bronchiolytics tend to be hypertensive. Um, so 100 over 60 for like a little four-month-old, um, you know, seems a touch high. 
Um, so if I'm gonna, you know, I, I may sort of just, you know, think a little bit about that. Um, SATs look okay. The respiratory rate um, in the 50s um, is on the sort of the higher end um, of what I would want for a four month old, but certainly not, um, you know, not something um, terrible. So these virals don't really scream at me in some, you know, um, fashion. Um, and, and I think that um, I, I would probably want to ask the team sort of how does the kid look like, you know, are we seeing any evidence of accessory muscle use uh, with that a little bit of a tachypnea, um, because if it's sort of comfortably tachypnic and well saturated and otherwise seems well supported, I may tell them, you know, this seems well enough for now. Um, if I'm being described a child that seems to be in significant amount of respiratory distress, um, using all his accessory muscles, head bobbing, having nasal flaring, um, then I may think of it a little bit. At the same time, I would expect the virals would be a little bit different for such a description. Um, but I would be sort of thinking about ways to um, um, escalate support in some fashion. I would also want to know, is this a kid who's you know, crying vigorously as I'm talking to the team, he's like screaming in the background, um, or is this a kid who's kind of laying there um, relatively, um, you know, disinterested in life? Uh, so, so I think that that would be, um, you know, along the lines of some of the things that would want to make me escalate or not. So if it's the, for, the former or the first of the two, I may say, um, you know, this would, you know, transition the baby onto our system. Um, and, and I do, um, I think it's interesting to, you know, even touch upon um, the, the variety of, of systems that folks use to, um, to deliver high flow. Um, I, you know, maybe it's not, it's interesting. So I would want to see what the other panelists are thinking about that. Um, depending on whether the child is on vapotherm at the referring facility or not, um, we do have an anecdotal experience of, um, you know, um, for some reason, and it would be interesting to see if any of the RT um, or, um, you know, other um, um, uh, expert panelists um, have any different kind of, a, of an experience, but, um, and I'm only saying vapotherm because it's one of them, but um, it, it so happens that a lot of um, in a lot of situations, I'm transitioning and I'm finding that if I transition one to one, then now my kid, if it's a baby and he has a pass in his mouth, the pass he blows out, you know, like it's clearly a ton of, um, you know, P valves, you know, go, um, um, go off. So it's clearly like too much flow and it wouldn't be um, unusually for me to even like cut the flow in half. Um, so that would be, um, so again, interesting to, to see and hear what other um, uh, experts um, um, uh, experience um, looks like. But um, so I think that it would be um, important for me to transition the patient onto my equipment and then assess and see how the patient looks on my equipment. Um, and then sort of take it from there. Again, if the virals seem, um, you know, within you know, a reasonable um, range, um, and again, depends on how I transport the child, how far is the transport, what team I have, uh, is this flight, is this ground, is it 15 minutes, is it two and a half hours? Um, so some of these things matter a little bit as well. Uh, but for this particular kid, I would say probably um, I may not want to escalate necessarily. This was a long answer. But looking forward to see if anyone else has any different um, thoughts. Bronchodilators, I didn't use to recommend them uh, with this bout of whatever triple, quadruple a viral emic that we've had. Um, I saw a lot of children that responded to um, um, uh, albuterol, whether they had a family history of asthma or a personal history of asthma or not. I don't know. The literature says it doesn't matter and it doesn't help. The reality is that sometimes it does. So I wouldn't fault folks for trying. Um, similar to um, similar story with a steroid, the literature says it does not help. Um, and um, but again, for the subset of children that um, you know tend to have a more of a reactive component, um, um, you know sometimes they if they respond to bronchodilator. Um, then similarly, they would um, get steroids. 
policies versus maintenance fluids. This child doesn't seem by vitals to be very dehydrated, but then again, um, you know, that will be assessed based on based off of a child's physical exam. Um, and then Racemi Cafe is interesting. Um, I thought Brad's comment about Racemi Cafe was uh, valid. Um, we similarly um, try it. <laughs> um, um, but, but again, the, um, uh, the literature doesn't necessarily support it, but our practice is similarly. Uh, so so I, I, I agree with Brad. <laughs> Phil and Monty, I, I'd be interested to hear what you guys are seeing from your teams uh, as as far as are you having a, any trouble transitioning your high flow? Um, most of what we're doing is a Fisher-Pakel OptiFlow system to a Fisher-Pakel OptiFlow system. So it's not a, I haven't had to titrate a whole lot, but coming off of Vapotherm or, or some of the other um, high flow systems, are you guys seeing any of the, the need to cut down like Karina was talking about? Sam, for, um, for me, uh, my experience lately has been that when we show up, they normally don't have the child on enough high flow. They're half of a liter per kilo, maybe a liter per kilo. Um, recommendation from our center you know, to the outside facilities is usually to go up. Kids don't like it. Outside facilities are scared because and they don't want the kid to cry. So a lot of times we get the places, they may be on Vapotherm, but the majority of them, we use the uh, same, you know, the, the Prequel um, system and um, don't have a whole lot. Or we get there, they've maxed out and we end up going to BiPAP okay. from these kids. Or a lot of times they don't start the treatment or they've just started it and they don't have a lot of pediatric experience. So they just want the kids out. Bill, same thing for you guys. Yeah, we're actually seeing a lot of, um, especially that last point uh, that you had made. Um, a lot of the community departments um, in Western Pennsylvania, Eastern Ohio, Northern West Virginia, where our catchment area is, um, really don't have a lot of pediatric expertise. Um, you know, very, very few actually have high flow that they're able to use on pediatrics, nonetheless, uh, infants. Um, so in general, yeah, we are, you know, going in and initiating uh, either our own high flow or um, probably more commonly for us BiPAP. Um, the other nice thing that we have in the region is actually a dedicated transport team for children's through um, Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh. So for Life Life, you know, we do transport a less number than, you know, say the regional children's team would, um, but we're still prepared, you know, because they only have one team. So uh, for backup calls or, you know, with the higher volume we've been seeing, um, we're doing a lot more of these as well. Nice. Has anybody seen where they've actually had to titrate down on the high flow and like the, the kid will potentially do better if we take a, they've been oversupported essentially. Um, is, is that something, go ahead, Brad. You're muted, Brad. Sorry about that, but your first comment that you started with is, is there too high of high flow? And I think these dovetail well. Believe it or not, there's a multi-center randomized control trial evaluating two liters per kilo versus three liters per kilo in the pediatric population. And they found kids that were placed on three liters per kilo per minute actually decompensated more frequently and required positive pressure ventilation. Part of their theory behind it, though not proven, was that that liter flow had them exhaling against it and actually caused them to fatigue. So um, the, therefore the recommend, recommend, recommended dose is two liters per kilo per minute um, from the literature. What, I guess on, on that, or Karina, do you have anything to add specifically on that? Are you, are you seeing your teams having to decrease on a regular basis? No, not on a regular basis. I, I'm seeing it most often with a transition um, uh, from so, and this is again, uh, I'm referencing the the post um, sort of September October um, um, you know surge viral surge where um, we at least Maryland and I know it's a national problem but Maryland had a lot of issues with bed capacity ICU bed capacity and as a matter of fact um, the, the the MIMS group actually worked on high flow guidelines for um, for the community hospital so they can. Um, manage the children in place um, because we had no ability to have 
um, any um, any type of, um, uh, of of ICU bed. Um, so a lot of the a lot of the children that would have been in an ICU year you know years prior or seasons prior were now on floor you know on the floor you know regular uh, ward uh, bed or not even transferred because there was just no capacity whatsoever. Um, so I think that um, in this setting, we saw a lot of um, community hospitals up titrating um, high flow quite a bit and utilizing it very liberally. Um, again, we put together some guidelines which um, had some level of evidence behind them. Some was a lot of um, you know, um, expert consensus um, and, um, you know, try to hold that. But so then when we do go and pick them up, um, you know, there, it was sort of a, you know, twofold, um, it was 50, 50, the chance that it was just, they were just on too much flow. And when we transition onto our, um, equipment, um, the same level flow, and this typically happened for, with vap vapotherm, um, we use Fisher Pakel as well, um, as someone else commented on that. Um, and um, the Hamilton P, um, you know, um, um, for the ones that don't don't have a heated sort of component. Um, and um, so so it would either be a little bit too much and clearly the children had, um, you know, were, were not even able to keep their pacifier again in the mouth uh, as, as testament that it was too much flow um, or it was obvious that they needed to be escalated. And at that point, usually they were already on the two per kilo and they had to be escalated onto a different um, type of um, support, generally, um, you know, BiPAP setup, CPAP or BiPAP setup. So that's, that was our experience, um, again, tainted by the capacity um, issues um, recently. Um, I would want to say that previously this had not been the case because folks were very reluctant to start high flow in the community and were going very, you know, small if they even started it started at 0 0.5 and then it would you know obviously escalate what have you guys seen as the triggers for non-invasive at what point do we abandon high flow and go to non-invasive on these kids what what is that sort of tipping point i mean i think it sort of varies um for children that were on the max amount of flow and we equally use the two per kilo as brad is commenting on we have also seen and 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 do believe that the uh, that too much that there is such a thing as, as too much flow, um, and so if they're on that and they're showing signs of respiratory failure, um, either clinically or um, again, it's amazing what this um, viral um, uh, pandemic or you know epidemic caused. Um, but uh, we actually had a lot of facilities that um, got re you know recurrent gases, blood gases on children. Um, Venus or CAP, um, some are filial, depending on how scared they were. Um, and if you clearly had acidosis, respiratory acidosis from that, um, so it was either a, a clinical or lab markers uh, or a combination of the two, then we would do it. Oftentimes, and it was, well, maybe not that as often, it would be the, it would be hypoxia. So they would be hypoxemic on this level of support and they were already on 100%. Um, on the, um, um, on high flow with um, you know the two per kilo um, and just not well supported uh, from an oxygenation standpoint, but that was probably a minority. I would say ventilatory support was the the majority of them for us. I'm to really curious to see what yeah go persistent ahead. persistent hypoxia. Does everybody sort of agree that persistent hypoxia is probably where? Where we uh, where we want to make that make that decision, Phil. If I call you and say this kid's still hypoxic and he's on sixteen liters and hundred uh, percent, are you telling me to go to non invasive? Yeah, so I'm probably probably a little bit um, different in that we're a little bit more likely to go to non invasive um, cause of pressure ventilation. It works well with our Hamilton um, ventilator that we're using, and um, it kind of goes towards this, you know, philosophy that we have for cases like this with, with the sickest of the sick patients, we want to almost over support them, not in the way of, you know, using too much high flow or work like that, but we want to really optimize these patients and support them as best as possible so that when we do put them in the back of a helicopter for 30, 60 minutes, whatever it is, mm -hmm. in a truly, you know, uncontrolled setting, um, we really minimize the risk of that patient deteriorating or, you know, decompensating because, you know, the last thing we want to do is have this patient tire out 
um, or have that persistent hypoxia, worsening acidosis, and then have to manage that, you know, at three or 4,000 feet with all the noise, vibration. Um, you don't want to be intubating that kid in that scenario. Um, and again, the other thing that we impress on our transport crews is that one of the first key decisions to make, is this a case where we need to load and go um, or stay in play? In the vast majority of these cases, uh, we're afforded the extra time to really sit at the recurring uh, site, do a good head-to-toe assessment, like Brad had mentioned, um, talk with medical command as needed, and optimize that patient, again, so that the risks during transport are minimized and we can hopefully ensure that they're not going to deteriorate. Um, so for that reason, you know, as long as the kid can tolerate it, um, we're a little bit more likely to use that, that non-invasive. Oh. Brad, I think you had something else to add. I think Phil, Phil answered it perfectly. Okay. All right, I, I think we're gonna keep moving. We got one more case that I think is gonna be, uh, gonna spur on a lot of discussion. So I wanna make sure we get to that. Uh, there were a couple questions in uh, in the uh, Q&A and uh, we'll get those questions to the panelists because I wanna move on to the next, to the next case. Um, so our next case here, um, a little sicker, let's go with that. Uh, so four-year-old, 16 kilo in status asthmaticus, about 50 and five zero minutes away by air, uh, a really small community hospital, um, history of poorly controlled asthma and uh, prior PICU admissions, um, presents to the ED, uh, continuous albuterol, uh, gets steroids at two per kilo, gets mag at 75, and uh, gets a, a loading dose of TURB um, and then the infusion. Uh, labs were positive for a rhino and enterovirus, um, and then chest x-ray, uh, no infiltrates, and that pulmonary uh, pulmonary infusion and uh, or pneumo or pneumothorax. So clean chest x-ray for the most part. Transport team gets there. Uh, the kid's head bobbing, grunting, agitated, in severe respiratory distress, and and looking at mom asking mom and the and the staff asking for help uh, to breathe. Just looks in distress. Um, Transport team appropriately immediate uh, immediate actions include some IMEPI, some uh, non-invasive BiPAP uh, with continuous albuterol. They give the kids some ketamine uh, and have really little minimal minimal uh, improvement. Uh, heart rates in the 130s. Kids pretty hypertensive at a buck 50 over 82. Breathe in 36 times a minute and satin in the 80s. Uh, and they're consulting for for guidance. Um, so lots of red flags, right? This is a sick kid, uh, unwell, right? So really the questions become now what? What are we supposed to do now? We've sort of reached the end of our, uh, our, our rope for, the, for lack of a better term here. So I really wanted to get a, an idea from the panel on what the next steps are, right? The kids on non-invasive, I would love to hear from the group about where we start that non-invasive, sort of what those numbers look like. Um, so, and then the sort of, we got the kid on non-invasive, we've got the uh, continuous bronchodilators running. Is there such thing as too much albuterol in, in a kid like this? Does it stop working at some point? Do we, do we, do we hit some sort of threshold? Brad? Thanks. Yeah. So, um, the one paper, which actually has been validated, um, I'm not muted, right? Um, so in terms of being too much al albuterol, I would um, I would say yes. So um, <clears throat> there's a couple papers out there that talk about diastolic um, dysfunction and increasing cardiac um, enzymes in the pediatric population. So once those receptors are probably fully saturated, I'd say there's probably not much more that you'd be doing to help them from the that piece of it. Ketamine does have some uh, bronco diet, uh, dilatory effects, so that's a good piece. I think, um, in my opinion, that um, I would want to make sure that the tank's full. So do we give them enough volume, maybe to bring that so that if we do have to take the next step, which may be advanced airway management, that they're in a good spot, that they're not going to decompensate further. Because kids in this level of distress, um, in my experience, have been used up all their endogenous catechols, and when you try to induce them, 
can become profoundly hypo um, pensive and that are hard to get them out of that spiral, if you will. So I think from my perspective is, yes, you can have too much albuterol. Um, and I would be questioning if this individual would need a little more resuscitation before you would take your next steps in airway management. But I'll listen to the rest of the panel. Monty, I'd be curious what your your thoughts on the uh, kid gets TURB. Have you seen TURB be effective um, and continuous versus just like the sub, uh, sub QIM TURB? And then what are your next medications? Epi, do you start an epi drip? Like where, where, do, where do you see these type of cases going? So for these kiddos, it's like um, we put them on the BiPAP, put them on, you know, your initial settings, try to give them time to settle out. The, you know, I think um, transport you want to fix and you want to fix now and two minutes feels like 10. So um, for, for me, it's like, yes, you know, you get in there, you get the IM epi going, you get the, um, you get the albuterol going. A lot of times you walk into these outside hospitals and you think they're getting continuous, but, you know, moms blow in the um, albuterol around because, you know, they're, they, they, they've got one RT for, you know, 20 beds or, you know, so they don't have anybody in the room with mom. Um, so our thing, you know, for me walking in, it's like, what, what, what's the presentation of this kiddo? This kid is obviously in distress, right? So um we're sometimes we're lucky and we have an RT to work with us. So we get that extra um, resource. A lot of times you go out with what, you know, what the information you have and you're going with two of you. So at that point, it's like, we know, you know, you got one person working on medications, get the kid on the BiPAP machine, um, give them time to settle, you know, five minutes later, after you've done all your interventions, you make sure they have the, you know, fluids. A lot of times they're, they haven't given them boluses. So, you know, you need to start all this stuff simultaneously. So um, TURB, I don't see that used a lot of times in the outside facilities. Um, we carry it, we use it, um, but it's usually way down the line after they've received their steroids and their mag and, and so forth. So as far as um, the TURB being used, I'm not quite sure I can say that, you know, I've seen it work immediately for transport. They continue the TURB when we get to the facilities. So, you know, I think that it's maybe a longer term, but to get it on board is what I've, you know, what, what I, my experience is seeing that. For this kiddo, I think that my um, threshold after a couple vent, you know, BiPAP setting changes, I, I'm already thinking that I'm probably going to need to take this child's airway. Is there yeah. a way to, to optimize this kid before we take his airway? Like, uh, Karina, I, I'd be interested. Like, it sounds like we're going to get forced to take this kid's airway. He seems extraordinarily sick. Um, is there, mm -hmm. can we reduce, can we redose the mag, um, epi, aminophilin? Is there a meta, is there a better order for, for those? Is, is there a better plan to optimize this kid before we take his airway? Yeah, so Sam, you probably described one of our worst nightmares, um, which is um, something that no intensivist will ever, and I'm sure no transport doc or transport team member will ever want to do, um, which is to um, innovate um, uh, an asthmatic or a, a person with reactive um, um, uh, airway disease. And I think that. Um, so I would probably try my very best not to do that. And I have seen that you crafted the vignette very carefully to disallow some things that I may have wanted to try, such as maybe heliox, because the child is slightly hypoxemic. So you made that, um, you took that away. Um, but I agree with both Brad and Moni that there are a lot of things that we, A, you want to make sure that um, the things that you think the child is getting, um, he's actually receiving. Um, and then um, our um, practice is, I've been medical director for our transport team for almost 10 years. Um, I think we've intubated, you know, probably less than five asthmatics. Um, now we sometimes receive them intubated because that's, you know, someone did that. 
um, and it becomes very, very tricky to get their CO2 down as, as everybody knows, which is, so the problem is the risk that the patient incurs on induction. And then subsequent to that, how do you manage the patient once he's intubated um, and is unable to, to, to get the CO2 under 100? Um, so I think that those are some of the, you know, the challenges. And if you're getting to that point, I think that there are some things we can do. But uh, up until that point, we, we personally, our team would personally try a whole bunch of things, maximizing the albuterol, um, you know, start giving epi, and I think we sometimes more than one time, if it seems like he responds, we give more. Um, we do carry terbutalin, we bolus, we start the drip. Uh, we are mindful of the fact that it can cause diastolic hypotension. Generally, if you start a little bit of a higher dose um, um, and, and fluid load, um, you, you mitigate to some extent that risk. Um, sometimes we have done, um, you know, we have done um, aminophilin, um, even in transport. Um, if they're not hypoxemic, um, you know, and you can get some heliox, um, there are certainly centers that have a lot of um, success with it for asthma. Um, and then, um, you know, titrating your BiPAP, you know, finding a mask that, that fits. The problem is, of course, if the child is very agitated and you need to sedate, um, you know, what are kind of, how do you do that without taking away the, the respiratory drive? Uh, and I think that the ketamine is a is sort of a great choice there um, with a um, bronchodilated dilatory effect. Um, so certainly this is what our team would probably do. Um, and then really titrating your, your, your BiPAP and, you know, seeing do you probably need full place BiPAP and making sure you don't increase your PEEP um, and that would be counterproductive. Um, and ultimately we've also manually exhaled children. Um, and so, um, and oftentimes we do it in transport as well. So suffice to say, I would probably get a gas. I will see if it starts with a six or a seven and, <laughs> and take it from there. So, I mean, those would be some of my thoughts. And sometimes, yes, you are, your hand is being forced, but I would want to make sure that I'm exploring and optimizing all my um, um, other tricks before I get to that point. You, you mentioned optimizing BiPAP and uh, I, I'd be curious, like, is that low PEEP? I, you mentioned not yeah. wanting to drive up the PEEP. I yeah. mean, yeah. I, I, I personally almost never run less than five of PEEP. Is this a situation where that's, you are running three okay. or, okay. That's probably okay. But oftentimes, you know, if depends on who starts it, I may find sure. that the kid is on, like, they put him on BiPAP and he's on 10 of PEEP and there is just a lot yeah. of competition. Um, so I would want to make sure that I bring that down. I think that it's, um, you know, sometimes you put them on BiPAP and whoever's the RT, you know, didn't make sure and the BiPAP's on, but the NEBs are off. So it, again, uh, as you guys know, even better than I do, those kind of boots on the ground, you just want to make sure that the child is getting what you think he's getting. Um, and it could be that you'll end up that you'll end up intubating. But um, again, I, I would be trying my hardest now to, just like everybody else, I'm assuming on this group, I don't think anybody would cavalierly want to just put a breathing tube in. Yeah, I get my hand forced and I, and we're backed into a corner. This kid's not getting rid, got, not getting mm -hmm. better on BiPAP. I, I have to intubate them. Um, what are, what's my induction look like? How do I take this kid's airway? Is it ketamine? Is that, is that really the, the answer? Um, and uh, a paralytic? Um, do you do a, some sort of delayed sequence on this kid to potentially get him a little bit or oxygenated before you, like the BiPAP plus the ketamine and sort of delay, do a delayed sequence? Um, I, I'd be curious, uh, Phil, what are your thoughts? I call you and I'm like, I, Dr. Rocky, I'm backed into a corner. Help. Yeah, so I agree with what um, everyone else on the panel that said. You really need to optimize this patient before you, you make that move. Um, it's really interesting. I think terbutaline really is one of those regional things in Maryland. Um, we don't see a lot of that in Western PA. It's a lot more uh, intramuscular epi as well as epi drips for these um, sorts of clinical scenarios. Uh, volume optimization, um, absolutely. And then if you are going to take 
you know, this person's airway. And I think your preparation and, and plan is going to be the most important thing. So you pre-oxygenate the crap out of them as best you can. Um, we use acne oxygenation during the actual intubation attempt as well. So putting a nasal cannula on at a flush rate of 15 liters or so. Um, and then I actually had a pretty similar clinical scenario a couple months ago now where we had a high performing um, crew member who called and said, hey, you know, I know it's not in the protocol, but I think this patient would be a good candidate for uh, the delayed sequence intubation that you have mentioned. Um, and we kind of discussed the plan. He did it and it was successful. So they had just given ketamine so that their you know, airway, their breathing reflexes are still intact. Um, because once you paralyze them, you're completely taking away their ability to oxygenate and ventilate for themselves. So for patients like this, they may only have you know, a physiologic reserve of 30 seconds or less before they truly get hypoxic, acidotic, and you know, hypotensive at that point. So even if they're only able to breathe, you know, random number at, you know, 25 or 50 percent, um, they, they're still breathing while you're attempting to intubate them just with the sedative ketamine. Um, and then once you are able to pass the tube or the bougie, then you can proceed with the paralytic, which will help you with your ventilator management as well. Um, but that's typically what that, you know, scenario looks like um, for our I, I agree. The one the, the one thing that I always have my team do is have pads on that patient, um, have a um, you know a good sort of team huddle so that everybody understands what the risks of induction would be for a patient like this, um, and actually have a team member or a person from the outside hospital. It's generally somebody who knows how to do it. So. Um, that that is prepared to do uh, to help with manual exhalation in the process. Um, I find it very very helpful um, because oftentimes you're really unable to um, to, to clear CO two. But uh, um, same as Phil suggested, I we would also um, do the apneic oxygenation with like you know the nasal cannula or the high flow. It just aids a little bit in the reserve. You would want to make sure he's really tanked up. They will be having a very high intrathoracic pressure. They will be having a lot of preload problems. Um, they will be acidotic. Uh, so I think that making sure they are, um, you're having fluid boluses and, um, um, and resuscitation um, agents too. It's, it's, it's tricky. Um, if I'm going to use a paralytic, which I don't ever want to do, it probably will be sucks unless I have a very clear um, sort of reason not to. Um, I would try not to. I would try, hmm. you know. So, so this um, is not a case where you would want to continue uh, redose the, the paralytic. This isn't a kid you want to keep paralyzed necessarily. This is a child that I would want to be able to. Um, um, you know, restore where I would want to be able to restore uh, spontaneous um, ventilation as soon as possible. And then utilize, um, you know, a high pressure support, low rate um, strategy. Um, again, you know, perhaps aided by, uh, by you know, uh, exhaled manual exhalation. Sometimes Again, we're a little bit of a different breed. I'm sure some, some other places are similar where the ICU comes out of the um, uh, ACCM. Um, so we have some experience with using, using um, volatile anesthetics um, in this group of patients. So pretty much it's, stand, it's so rare that we would bring an intubated asthmatic that as we bring him, we bring him in, in an isofluorine room. Like it's so rare that we would need to do that. Um, for fear that the, <laughs> um, we would not be able to to um, to manage them. Moni, are you guys using uh, manual exhalation in uh, in your practice? We are, if we need to. We don't like okay. to intubate asthmatics either. So, sure. but it is in the protocol. And how often are you doing? How are you guys doing that? Or is it just when you feel like you need it? Is it a timed thing? Is it based on a CO two? It's based on presentation CO two. Brad, when you were at Children's, were you guys using that as well? Is that that feeds transport thing? Um, 
Yeah, we, we have used it, Sam. Um, I will tell you um, infrequently, but when it was the worst case scenario, um, I'm going to date myself and everybody's going to probably laugh, but I also did transport in patients that ended up getting intubated with severe asthma. The ventilator had a sine wave because it actually decreased the um, inspiratory pressure. So we would carry a bear 33, which has been out of the market since probably 2007 to actually um, have better gas distribution, better tidal volume distribution, because it's, it's again, a sine wave more anatomic. Um, so I've done that in my past as well. So there are strategies um, and I appreciate the volatile gas, um, anesthetic gas piece because we've done that too. Um, there's also some emerging literature about putting, um, if they're not able to ventilate, um, going to BV, or yeah, BV ECMO and helping them just scrub CO2 and provide a little bit of extra gas exchange until they can reverse the bronchospasm. Yeah, I mean, this is, these patients are, are super duper sick and uh, I'd be interested to, Karina, you mentioned like a high pressure, low rate um, type of ventilation. Are, are you, are we just trying to get as much minute ventilation as possible without over pressurizing them? Um, like what's our tidal volume goals? Uh, or, like how are you titrating the ventilator? Are you using a, it sounds like you guys are using pressure and not volume in these kids. Um, I'd be curious mechanical ventilation setups. Yeah, I think that, so I think one of the reasons it's so, um, folks dislike intubating children so much is that now you have them intubated and if you're going to observe them breathing you know, on their own, you'll see that, um, you know, they're, they're struggling quite a bit to exhale, right? So they will have this very, very, very prolonged exhalation phase. And, um, you know, you're going to worry a lot about air trapping in these kids. You're worrying that, that you're not able to, uh, that you're not going to be able to mimic that um, in an, in an um, intubated patient. Um, so it's not, you know, you will have these children obviously with with their end, end tidal CO two monitoring, and um, you know it's not uncommon for you to see triple digit numbers um, or high double digit numbers. Um, so certainly there is, um, you know, you can follow that. You can follow, um, um, you know, physical exam, um, but probably I would want. If at, if at all possible, I would probably want to put the kid on, you know, a peep that matches somewhat their intrinsic peep and, um, you know, if putting high respiratory, high pressure support, you know, high, sometimes in the 20s, um, and then a very low rate, you know, four, six, eight, and then watch their volumes um, on the vent. Um, and seeing that alone, seeing with your additional, um, you know, manual exhalation, additional epi, additional bronchodilators, if you're able to bring down the CO2. Um, it is rare that different vent strategies work, at least in the ICU setting. And, and, um, and for transport too, it's hard to prescribe it um, in some fashion. These are some of the children who for us need minute to minute um, medical control, um, which is why in our, um, you know, every, every system is a little bit different. We send pediatric critical care fellows for, for certain um, calls and these would be some of the calls that um, get, um, you know, an RT and a, and a pediatric critical care fellow, mostly because you pretty much, um, you know, need to make adjustments it, it can, it's hard to it's hard to kind of set a goal, prescribe it, and then walk away. And it would be similar in the ICU. I would probably stay at this kid's bedside for quite a bit of time, um, you know, trying to get um, his minute ventilation um, up and um, you know clear CO two. Curious to see what other folks do, but that's what we usually do.
Anybody want to chime in real fast? I think we're just about to wrap it up. So yeah. Sam, the one thing I'll just tell you is there's some evidence out there, which is, and Phil, you can definitely add to this, but um, it, with the volume ventilation, you can get an idea of what they're actually trapping. So if you put in 500, what's coming out? And then the other part is making sure your extended ID ratios. Um, one of the areas that I think, I don't know how emerging it is, but I'd like to hear it from the panel is um, setting peeps to keep those airways open. Um, I've never had experience with it. So I know um, there was some discussion about it, but I haven't personally had any experience with setting that to um, intrinsic peep. Yeah, no, I was just actually going to echo what everybody um, or others on the panel had said. Um, we actually came up with a new pediatric vent uh, protocol for this year, and it does go straight to um, pressure support ventilation uh, with similar settings as was kind of mentioned. Um, but yeah, Sam, thanks for having me. I think to shift the drop off because I work at seven, um, but thank you very much for having me. These were great cases as always. Um, so thanks for putting this together. Thanks a lot for hopping on, Phil. Have a, have a good shift tonight. All right, take care, guys. Guys, thank you so much for being here. Um, if some of the panel members can can stay on, uh, there's a couple questions in the Q and A. I don't know if you guys can see those. I, I'd love if you guys could answer those potentially. Uh, thank you to everybody for joining. This has been a blast, and I uh, I always appreciate all my my smart friends hopping on and hanging out with me. I, I very much uh, appreciate that. So, thank you so much to everybody. Um, and I can't thank you enough for being here. Sam, as far as the uh, questions go, the, the first one um, out there, it sounds like we we sort of touched upon that already. Um, you know, I think Karina had mentioned that e even though bronchodilators are not necessarily indicated in the uh, bronchiolytic patient, there may be somebody with underlying reactive airway disease um, in their family and trialing it on the patient may actually help, right? Um, I think we've heard from all the panelists that there is a bit of a difference between what is written in the book and what is done in practice based on one's own clinical experience. And that's why we practice medicine, to develop our own experience that impacts our decision making. So medicine is an art, right? It's not necessarily a specific science where we take what's in the book and we apply it directly to the patient. I think we use our experience to ultimately come up with what we think is of the best interest of each individual. So I, I think we sort of touched upon that. Um, the next question um, addresses sort of titration um, based on, yep, equipment, differences in equipment. Uh, ben Lawner um, has an opinion on terbutylene. Uh, again, certainly debated out there amongst clinicians. Some people like terbutylene, some people don't like terbutylene. I think at the end of the day, once you start getting down that road of utilizing things like terbutylene and aminophilin, um, you're really doing everything you can to see if anything is going to work so you avoid going down that road of intubating the patient for all the reasons we just discussed. Uh, and then uh, Ruben Troncoso um, added on here, other than decreased respiratory drive and not tolerating the mask, are there any other reasons pediatric patients, I think, don't tolerate BiPAP? Uh, do you have any experience with sedating patients in BiPAPs? Um, and if so, what has been your experience? So I don't know, Karina, if you wanted to take that, it sounds like part of the sort of delayed sequence component, trying to get them to tolerate the mask. If they don't, proceeding to intubation. If they do, then it's a win. Yeah, I mean, the only other thing I want to say is I had a, um, a patient maybe in the last month or so that reminded me of this possibility um, who was severely has profound respiratory failure. We managed to not intubate him, thankfully. Um, but um, he was on very high BiPAP settings and um, actually ended up having a lot of um, battle trauma from that. Um, ended up with a ton of sub-Q air, you know, pneumomediastinum. Um, so that would be um, probably, uh, it never became hemodynamically um, impactful. Um, but it's the one thing that I also want to think about, or you, you mustn't sort of forget about kind of that component. If, if the the you know if you're reaching sort of the limits of your therapy, um, either because of um, you know inability to tolerate or lack of uh, or or sort of side effect profile or um, you know disease trajectory. Um, so 
I just kind of wanted to just add that for the group since it, I hadn't seen something so impressive in a, in a long time. Um, and then it reminded me that it's, you know, yet again possible. Um, so, and I don't know what the other part of it was. Um, no, no. It was a two part question. I, I think you addressed it. It's, you know, yeah. how do you really optimize a patient and somebody who's not necessarily tolerating? Yeah. And, and I do think that the sedation piece, I personally try to use an agent that does not depress the respiratory drive um, significantly. Um, so that generally ends up being, you know, ketamine. In, um, in the ICU, I may be able to add a little dexmedetomidine if I feel like there is, um, um, you know, a, a need for something different. Um, I think it's hard on transport. A lot of people would go to probably benzos, and I think that um, you should pause it. You know, but what is with every agent that we we use, we we have to kind of pause and think about pluses and minuses um, for using a benzo and, and someone like that. Great, thank you, Sam. You want to wrap it up with the uh, QR codes here? Yeah. Once again, uh, I want to thank everybody for being here. Um, so QR code on the left, that's the link to the registration site. We hope you guys will join us in person uh, in March. Um, and uh, like we mentioned, there's now a virtual option, but uh, let's be honest, everybody's done uh, with uh, virtual conferences. So please come in person, come hang out. Um, uh, Brad and our friends from Stat Medivac are throwing a party. Um, and uh, so come eat, come eat the food and, uh, hang out. We want to see you, see you here. The, uh, QR code on the right is the Con Ed survey. Go ahead and do jump on, do that survey. And, uh, we'll get you a Con Ed certificate out, uh, for this 90 minutes of, of phenomenal education in, in the next couple of weeks. Um, so thank you again to all the panelists. I cannot thank you enough for being here. Um, if it weren't for you guys, it would just be Asa and I talking and nobody wants to hear that. So, um, I'm surprised Chad didn't pop up and pop on and give his two cents on that. Um, so thank you again, everybody. There he is. <laughs> thank you again, everybody. And uh, have a good night.